This video is sponsored by Squarespace. I'm pleased to report that I successfully grew bread from the ground. I planted wheat in the fall, grew it over the winter, harvested it in late spring, cured it, threshed it, winnowed it, milled it, and baked it. It was a ton of work, resulting in probably the worst loaf of bread I've ever had. I can totally see why we went with the whole modern industrialized food system thing. It has its advantages, but this was a real fun thing for me to do nonetheless. Starting eight or 10,000 years ago, I think it's safe to say most people on this planet would have spent at least some of their time participating in the growing and or processing of grain-based foods. To do it yourself is to feel in your bones what it was like to be human up until very recently when these processes were mechanized in the developed world and people like me ceased to have any hand in them at all. Step one is plant some wheat seeds, otherwise known as wheat. The thing that we eat, that's the same thing that we put in the ground to get more of it. All grasses make seeds, even your lawn grass if you don't mow it down. Wheat is just a group of grass species that produce giant versions of those seeds. Our hunter-gatherer ancestors just picked those seeds off of the wild plants. This is a story told by Dr. Catherine Zabinski, an ecologist at Montana State University and author of Amber Waves, The Extraordinary Biography of Wheat from Wild Grass to World Megacrop. They would likely have found um, is just scattered bunches of grasses on a hillside growing with a mix of a bunch of other grass species, maybe underneath oak trees. When the grains are just ripening like that, they're soft. The carbs in there are kind of milky. So you can pick the seeds right off the plant and eat it raw. It doesn't really taste like anything, maybe a little sweet. Dr. Zabinski is pretty sure that's where it all started. People just eating kind of fresh, soft grains right off of the plant. But pretty soon, people started to eat dried grains, grains that either dried by themselves on the plant and maybe fell off, you can collect them off the ground like that, or grains that people dried themselves. Arguably, the chief virtue of grain as a food source is that when it is dried, it is preserved. You can carry it with you. You can eat it through the winter when there's less fresh food around. We find grinding tools like you would use for grass seeds oh, as long ago as 30,000 years ago. Before we find evidence of settlements, so very likely you'd have tools like that in areas where there were stands of wheat. And if you were nomadic and moving around to follow food sources, you'd arrive at the wheat and rye and other wild grasses at those stands during the season where you knew you could gather ripe grass seeds. Suffice it to say, these would have been pretty meager meals. The seeds of ancient grass plants were a lot smaller than these. And these are hardly the creme de la creme. The only wheat I could find at a garden store was the stuff sold for animal feed, not for planting. So I have no idea what variety this is. It's probably a grab bag. Hey, there's some corn, bonus, I guess. I tilled my soil, just dug it up to loosen it so that the seeds can sink down in there. And I'm simply throwing them on the ground somewhat indiscriminately. This is a planting technique known as broadcasting. Hey, let's keep a running tally of common words or phrases that have their origins in the farming or processing of grains. That's number one, broadcasting. This all started in what we now call the Middle East. It was about nine or 10,000 years ago when we've got the first evidence of people actually planting wheat seeds and growing a field of wheat. You gotta admire the discipline it would have taken to do that. As I was planting, I just kept thinking, this is food that I'm just throwing on the ground. You gotta figure that ancient people, perpetually on the edge of starvation, they would have had trouble thinking months ahead instead of just eating what they already had in their hands. Hence the expression, don't eat your seed corn. It means don't allow your immediate desires to ruin your future. Corn in English used to mean any kind of grain, or more broadly, any small, hard thing. Though the grains started to get less small as humans began to farm them. Definitely by the time of the ancient Greeks, there was fairly early on a sense of Ah, we should save the big seeds because that will help us to get 
better wheat plants next year and more. As late fall came and the weather got cold and rainy, I noticed my wheat had sprouted. That little white curly cue there, that is the wheat sprout. And as it grows, you get what looks like blades of grass, because that's exactly what they are. This is what it looked like around Christmas. Here in the southern U.S., lawns in fancy neighborhoods will often be this kind of iridescent green in winter because people plant an annual crop of wheat or rye on top of their normal turf grass just so they can have a vibrant green lawn in the cold months. Look at this. This is where my kids spilled the bag of feed seed on the lawn. Is that dirty? I didn't till that ground or anything, and the wheat still took root. Did real good. Now you might be wondering, why do people grow wheat in the winter? Why not grow it in the warm months when most other food is grown? Well, you can, and summer wheat is a thing. There are varieties that grow well when you plant them in the spring and then harvest them in late summer into the fall. But historically speaking, winter wheat was the main event, the main crop. The original wild wheat was a winter wheat. And that makes sense when you consider where wheat came from, the Middle East. The plant would germinate in the fall, and then you'd have a cool, wet winter, and not a lot happened. But you'd have these, you know, short plants that overwintered. And then in the spring, once things warmed up, they were ready to grow and they could complete their life cycle pretty quickly, which was important because the summers were really hot. Indeed, when I first moved from the temperate northern U.S. to the sweltering southern U.S., I discovered that there are two winters down here. There's the cold winter and there's the hot winter. The dog days of summer when plants really struggle to grow and nobody really wants to be outside for very long. It's just like winter, but it's hot. Wheat comes from a place that has hot winter. And as soon as the heat and the drought started, who cares for wheat? I mean, we're done. We've produced our seeds and now we're just going to wait till the first fall rains when you've got, you know, the soils are a little cooler, you've got some moisture and we're going to germinate again. But winter wheat can also do great up north, like Montana, where Dr. Zabinski is. A snow blanket insulates the plant through the coldest months. It was my birthday in March when I noticed the first ears on my wheat. That's what those are called, those little vertical stacks of seeds, or rather I should call them fruits. Grains are technically fruits because they grow out of tiny little flowers. It's interesting, planting wheat is a little bit of work. Harvesting and processing wheat is a lot of work, but in between, the like half of the year in between those two acts, you kind of don't really do anything. You just guess make sure that animals don't trample it down or graze on it. Otherwise, you just let it grow. You can totally get a sense of why ancient people who successfully farmed grains also had time to build ziggurats and invent writing systems and new and interesting ways to kill each other for stupid reasons. Hence, civilization, with and without ironic air quotes. Everything with my little 50 square foot plot was going great until a big spring thunderstorm came and whoomp, most of it fell over. I thought that it might stand up again once the rain evaporated off, but nope. It just laid there in a tangled mess, exacerbated by the fact that I think I planted my wheat a little too densely. It's really bad when wheat falls over. It doesn't get as much light down there to grow big, plump grains, and it's a lot harder to harvest as something that I'll show you. And when it's down there like that, it's way more susceptible to disease and infestation, things that generally come from the ground and that like the shady, damp conditions down there near the ground. At first, I thought that was dirt on the wheat there, but then I looked real close and uh, nope, those are aphids, little tiny bugs that suck the nutrient-rich sap out of tender plant parts. Ladybugs eat aphids, that's why ladybugs are a farmer's friend, but my aphids seem to be multiplying too fast for the ladybugs to keep up with. Why did this happen? Why did my beautiful wheat tumble over? Well, this can happen for a few reasons, but here's one of them. If your variety of wheat is not adept at managing high nitrogen contents, sometimes the stems can grow too tall and then they tip over, which is called lodging. Lodging. My wheat lodged. Perhaps because I overfed it. 
I've worked really hard on that garden plot for many years, building up the soil nutrients with chemicals and compost. The original wild wheat rarely had dirt so good. It's just like with us people. Modern abundance has made nutrients so available to us that it causes certain parts of us to grow more than is optimal for our biofunctions. Same deal with the wheat. The plant gets too much nitrogen and water and sunshine, the stem grows too tall, and it flops over before it can complete its reproductive cycle. Lodging wheat got to be a particular problem in the mid-20th century. Why? Because northern countries, like the United States, started to export their modern agricultural practices down to bright, sunny southern countries, like Mexico. This was all part of an incredibly momentous event in human history known as the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution was actually designed to help fight what they called the Red Revolution, or the spread of communism. You gotta appease that proletariat before they rise up with the commies. You gotta keep them well fed. Better fed than red. And this is why American capitalism, in the form of the Rockefeller Foundation, sent a guy named Norman Borlaug to Mexico. It is often argued that Norman Borlaug is one of the most important people whom most people have never heard of. The first thing he did down in Mexico was breed wheat that was resistant to a terrible fungal disease that they had down there called stem rust. At that point, he had these healthy plants, and he was boosting them with modern fertilizer and modern irrigation techniques. Job done! Red menace abated, right? But once you do that, especially in a climate that's fairly hospitable for plant growth, like parts of Mexico and Georgia, um, your plants grow really tall with uh, extra fertilizer and they'll lodge or tip over. So Borlaug crossbred his wheat with a dwarf variety from Japan, wheat with really short, fat stems. The result is the modern, semi-dwarf, disease-resistant wheat that doesn't fall over. There's a lot of bad things you could say about the Green Revolution, and maybe we'll say them another day, but it is certainly true that Norman Borlaug's work saved the lives of millions and millions of people from famine and from resource wars. He was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970, and he died at home in Texas in 2009, age 95. Borlaug couldn't save my wheat, though. Again, I actually have no idea what variety this is. It's just feed wheat. And it's not quite dry enough for harvest there, but between the infestation and the fact that I sold that house in Georgia to move up here to Tennessee, well, I decided that it was time to reap what I had sown. Creating things from the earth, that's hard. Creating things from Squarespace, that's ridiculously easy. For example, here's all it takes to make a website with a moving background image instead of a static picture. Every time I go to squarespace.com and start building a website totally for free, I see that they've added some new function that allows you to focus on your business, your creativity, and leave the technicals to somebody else. Squarespace makes website templates that you can customize for yourself and minutes. They let you drop in an appointment calendar or an open table block to take reservations. And Squarespace will help you take people's money, sell a product, accept donations. Squarespace handles all the credit card stuff. They host your site for you, and they register your custom domain for you. It's the only company you'll need to launch your site. Do me a solid and tell them I sent you. Go to squarespace.com slash Ragusea, or enter my code Ragusea at checkout, and you will save 10%. Thank you, Squarespace. Your sites look tasty tastier than the bread that I grew, although that is not saying much. It's literally full of sand. I'll show you why next time. There's a flame in your video. Yes. It's good that I have the flame right next to the, like... The wheat? Yeah, nicely dried. Part, yeah. For part two. Hey! <laughs>